Welcome to Homegrown History with Limestone County archivist Rebecca Davis and longtime Athens, Alabama native Richard Martin. Each episode, Richard and Rebecca bring to life some of the famous and infamous stories etched in Limestone County's rich history. Hello and welcome to the Homegrown History Podcast, the Limestone County, Alabama History Stories. I am Rebecca Davis. I'm the archivist at the Limestone County Archives. I'm your co-host here with Richard Martin. I'm the oldest one here. I'm 81. That's right. Hallelujah indeed. We are so (laughs) grateful and blessed. The Lord has seen fit to grace us with your presence. Lo, these many years, Richard. And today, (laughs) today, we're very excited to have back one of our very special guests, Dr. Harry Joyner, who is retired professor from Athens State University. He is the man who literally wrote the book on Alabama history. And uh, you may remember, if you if you haven't listened, to go back and listen to the couple of podcasts we had with him talking about early, early Limestone County and Alabama history. And today, he's going to be talking to us about another area of expertise. Uh, Dr. Joyner, tell us a little bit about what you got for us today. Well, it's going to be the history of Athens State uh, University from start to finish. That's right. Athens State is our hometown university, and you may know it is also the oldest institution of higher education in Alabama. So with that, Dr. Jordan, why don't you just get us started at the beginning? Okay. This uh, beautiful college and campus that we have today didn't magically appear. Uh, It took a lot of love, sweat, and treasure to transform uh, these 40 acres of land that the college stands on into a beautiful university that we have today. Uh, The historical sign in front of Founders Hall proudly proclaims that Athens State is Alabama's oldest institution of higher learning in continuous service since 1822. And what a great legacy and what a great love story because it's been the people of Athens and Limestone County that have really kept it going since 1822. That's right. Amen. Um, It all started in 1821 when Judge John McKinley of Huntsville, and I doubt if many people listening have ever heard of him, he agreed to give the five acres of land on a small hill north of the Big Spring to Robert Beatty and seven additional trustees. Realizing the importance of education, these prominent families of Limestone County wanted to open a small female academy for their own daughters, as well as other young women in the surrounding region. I guess the boys would be in the cotton fields. That's right. (laughs) That's where they belong. That's where they belong. (laughs) One of the most prominent lawyers in Alabama, Judge McKinley, later became a congressman, a senator, and the first Alabamian to serve on the U.S. Supreme Court. Oh, my goodness. I didn't know that. That's interesting. Uh, He eventually gave 35 additional acres of land between Brown Hall and the Carter P.E. building so that the faculty and students could grow food and keep animals. Right. For Wait, uh, so those 35 acres, is that all part of what's uh, part of the campus today or is oh, some yeah, of that yeah, what no. is now neighborhood? No. It kind of stopped at the at the PE building. Okay. Gotcha. And uh, it was the uh, you know, the land to the south at uh, Beasley Field. It's a big old pasture. Right. Sure. So Athens State uh, University was born out of the love that a small group of parents had for young women and for the ways in which education could enrich their lives. The first four-room wooden building was built in the vicinity of Brown Hall. That's where it was. In 1842, Thomas Macklin gave five acres of land along Beatty Street to erect a beautiful Greek Revival building, Founders Hall, quote, to encourage Methodist adoption of the school. The Tennessee Conference of the Methodist Church agreed to support the Athens Female Collegiate Institute and local Methodists raised the $10,000 to build Founders Hall. 
Uh, that was a lot of money. Back. That's that was like ten thousand dollars to build Founders Hall. Right. Wow, eighteen forty. Right. <laughs> and how much has it cost to renovate it over the years? <laughs> well, I think the uh, last renovation was about a million dollars, but it's a it, wow. Uh, it's really irreplaceable, and we're thankful that it has lasted. Oh, amen. I, I've often said, if there's a tornado in the region. Go to Founders Hall. Go to Founders Hall. Oh, no kidding. <laughs> it's been here since 1840. That's the truth. Uh, the uh, Methodist Church really uh, kept it going until 1975 when it uh, became a state institution. So it was a faithful and important part of the college's history for 133 years. This was a Methodist institution along with Birmingham Southern and Huntington College. That's right. And that's what made it difficult for the Methodist Church to support all three institutions. Sure. You know, it had three. The legendary Madam Jane Hamilton Childs personally assumed the college's debt of $836 when she became president in 1858. In those days, uh, the, the president was responsible for the debts of the college and it's amazing that uh, she would do this, but she came from Huntsville. She was a widow of a wealthy importer from Baltimore, and she adorned Founders Hall with her own fine furniture, mirrors, rugs, paintings, and a piano. Her ingenuity and courage saved the college from destruction from the invading Union soldiers who burned Athens on May 1st, 1862. Right. Uh, it is claimed that she produced a letter from Abraham Lincoln telling the commanding officer, Union officer, to spare this college. Yeah, I wanted to ask you a little bit more about that. So, you know, is my understanding that uh, Turchin, the, the right, officer, right. showed up at the front steps and she came running out there with a letter. Right. And either A, it was from Lincoln, yeah. which no. she had friends. Was she was from Baltimore. Yeah, yeah, she was brought her in, um, oh, the Secretary of State, uh, Seward. She was friends with his wife. Okay. So she was well connected, yeah. from what I understand. But then it's possible, Turchin, you know, he was originally Russian. Yeah. It's possible he couldn't read it and he just assumed. <laughs> and now, and also it's possible that it never happened, Right. Nobody knows. We we hope that it, you know, her story is true. Is, is true, but uh, I don't know that they would have burned Founders Hall. They probably would have turned it into a who know hospital or sure. something. But the story really didn't come out or was publicized <laughs> until about fifty years later. Whenever a student said they remembered that happening, right? Right. I, I think there's a good chance that she probably wrote the letter. You know, just and. But I'm not sure. Sneaky, right. sneaky. I'd yeah. love to see she a would, woman outwit a man that's like that. Right. Yeah, she's very smart. <laughs> Present company excluded, of course, yeah. gentlemen. <laughs> Which, before we get too far, too, I, I had a question about Founders Hall. Mm -hmm. It's my understanding that back then, most of what um, you see there would have been built by slave labor. Is oh, yeah. that correct? Right, exactly. And yeah. so a, a lot of the beautiful buildings that are connected then would have been built by slave labor. Now, tell me this. Is it true about the whiskey bottle in the column? No idea. You I know what I'm talking about? I wasn't there. Uh, so uh, I've heard that some guy was out there laying bricks and he... Lay a bit, nip yeah. a bit, lay a bit, nip a bit, and okay. hide it back down in the column. Right. And then as the column got too high for him to reach back down, so he just had to, <laughs> to leave it. Yeah. And now I understand the columns are also named Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, aren't That's they? right. And I'm, I don't know who named them that. I, Richard, I don't think you did. No, I know I didn't. <laughs> Funny story. The first time I got married, no, I've only been married once. Yes. It didn't last as long as the college, right, but right. I did get married right in between Mark and Luke. As so many people have. Exactly. It's a beautiful. It's beautiful. Uh, you don't even need flowers or anything, no. really. It's just so gorgeous. And it only cost $25 to rent the front steps of, of Founders Hall <laughs> to get married. So yeah. it might cost more than that now, but, right. you know. Fellas, ladies, if you're looking for a cheap place to get married, you could do a whole lot worse than Founders Hall. And maybe it'll and, last longer than mine. <laughs> and a beautiful place. Uh, it it really married. is. And, you know, we have our summer graduations out there. My mama graduated from there when right? she was in her 40s. She mm -hmm. went back to college at Athens so, State when she was so 44. So many people have gone back mm -hmm. uh, right. in later years. Yeah. She and my sister were in college there at the same time, as a matter of fact. Yeah. Uh, the uh, North Alabama Conference of the Methodist Church became the sponsor of, and we've had a lot of name changes. Mm -hmm. uh, in 1870, it was called the Athens Female Institute. Right. 
And there was a financial agent hired. He had a small salary, a horse, (laughs) and travel expenses to go around the different churches in North Alabama and raise money. Right. So that was the first Athens State University Foundation, huh? I guess. Just a man and his horse. Well, uh, the thing about it, again, it's it's the Methodist Church which kept it going up until 75. Mm-hmm. Without the support of the Methodist Church of North Alabama. It started North. off with the Tennessee Conference. Right. And then changed to the North Alabama Conference after exactly. the war. After the war. In 1893, uh, construction began on a two-story south wing of Founders Hall with funds provided by Willis Vaughn, a prominent banker and Methodist layman from Elkmont. Elkmont, yeah. Elkmont. B. Vaughn. Uh, is there still family up there? Yes. Okay. Yes. okay. And here in Athens, too. Um, if you look at Founders Hall, you, you try the, the original part, you can see it goes from the uh, north windows, those big windows, and then Vaughn Hall was added to the south wing. And then a third floor was added to Vaughn Hall in 1907. Um, Between 1889 and 1915, the college was known as Athens Female College. The Mm -hmm. name changed once again. Before you go too far, about that third floor, (laughs) in the archives, there's a little postcard or, you know, a letterhead that shows what Athens State looked like when it was just two floors because it didn't have the little doghouse dormers, what Founders Hall looked like. Right. So it was just the one roof line without the little doghouse dormers. Right. Well, whoever had sent something on this letterhead and had this drawing of of what it looked like apparently did not approve of the changes because you can see where at the beginning of the letter they wrote, the Institute, as it looked before they went and ruined it by changing the roof line. And the reason. So everybody's a critic. <laughs> uh, I think it was 1907, uh-huh. when, which I, and I like the dormers myself. I do too. Yeah. Well, that was dorms uh-huh. for kids to stay up there. It was mainly a residential because, you know, uh, th- there weren't any cars right. back then. Mm-hmm. It was horses. Right. And so most of the girls lived there, and that's why the third floor of Founders Hall, uh, when I went there, had a shower and bathroom. And mm-hmm. uh, I think there's some hooks in the ceiling. And I think that's where they really would hang clothes. Mm -hmm. That's what I believe. Yeah. But from 1889 to 1915, Zachary Parker was the president in 1895. And times were not easy for the college because there never seemed to be enough money to pay all the expenses. Here is what a local newspaper wrote about the dire financial condition of the Athens Female College in 1898. Quote, President Parker took hold of the venerable old college here when it seemed that final disaster had at last triumphed over all. And in very little while, order came out of chaos and victory out of what appeared to be final defeat. Wow. Pretty dire. So uh, President Parker raised $6,000 in two years to pay the bill. Right. Uh, Here's what the college looked like uh, when Mary Norman Moore became president in 1904. There was a barn, a pig pen, a large garden, very large garden, storage sheds, chickens, a small herd of dairy cattle. Right. Mm -hmm and a white picket fence surrounded Founders Hall. Mm. That's cool. Uh Uh, There was no electricity or running water in the building. You know, I wanted to say the archives has some postcards, very old postcards, in Uh which you can see that fence that surrounded, because there was a gate, too. It's a picture from the front gate of Athens College. That's right. The gate was to keep all the boys out. That's right. Well, that's the truth. Maybe the girls in. I don't know. Keep the girls in. (laughs) They didn't want them running out to the cotton field to find those men out there. (laughs) Uh, There were uh, 60 students uh, living uh, on the campus at that time. That's more than today. Mm -hmm. And 137 students went to the college Uh, around 1904. That's a lot of kids. Yeah, it is. Uh, If you think about it, uh, and it's a tribute to Athens, no other city, at least before the Civil War, north of Tuscaloosa, had a college for their girls. Huntsville didn't have it. Decatur didn't have it. 
Gadsden, Anniston, they didn't exist. Birmingham didn't exist. Uh, and that's why uh, Athens College attracted students, college students from Mississippi mm-hmm. and Tennessee and Georgia and other states. Is that part of why Athens, you know, I think of Athens, as long as I've known, has been a very strong college for education. Mm-hmm. And when you think about it, when it was established, education was about the only field that women really could go into to work outside the home, one of the very few. So is that part of why they have just always had this strong um, education? Well, you know, uh, education has changed over time. In, in 1900, I think probably all you needed was two years of college. Mm-hmm. Uh, there were no tests uh, to become a teacher. I'm not sure about the University of Alabama. I don't. Well, you didn't have four-year colleges until much later. Oh. It was basically two years. Mm-hmm. Right. right. Well, I mean, I know even farther back, even if you wanted to become a lawyer or a doctor, yeah. all you really had to do was apprentice, apprentice. learn the trade, yeah. and you're good to go. That's right. <laughs> and uh, if you were a barber, you just had to know how to cut hair. That's right. So a lot of these women were probably much more they, educated than well, the men. Oh, them. yeah. You know, they stress English and literature and poetry. And uh, there, there was a lot of music, piano, singing, art, religion, philosophy, history. They, they wanted their daughters to have some refinement and, and that type right. of thing. Well, you know, and part of it too was more so than getting a job outside the home would be to be a very right. refined wife so you could snag you a very wealthy man. Right. There wasn't any thought of working outside the home. It was just to educate their daughters right. for life and to you know, widen their horizons and things. Schools of education came much, much later. And uh, I know that it wasn't until after, it's sometime in the 20s that they had four years or, for teachers. Uh, there were 10 female faculty members from several states who taught at the college in 1904 and tuition was $40 a semester. Oh, wow. That's what they would pay. Athens College made uh, considerable progress during President Moore's 17 years of leadership. Well, and now, so, well, hold up. President ahead. Moore. Yeah. Are you talking about Mary? Yeah. Mary Norman Mary. Moore. She's my favorite. Tell me a little bit about her, and I'll, I'll Richard, see her line notes. I, I knew her through Buzz <laughs> Esther. She was a highly educated woman and very... She'd drive that little Ford car, and you got out of her way. She'd run over <laughs> But she was a very sweet lady. So I actually portrayed her at the cemetery stroll a few years ago. So if you'll indulge me, Mary Norman Moore McCoy is one of my favorite people of Limestone County history. For one thing, she was born on my birthday, August 6th. So you know right there she was an amazing person. But she was born in the Oakwood Plantation in Huntsville. You know where Oakwood Avenue is? Oakwood Avenue was actually named for the plantation, not the university I didn't over know there. That. That's where her plantation was. And her father was good friends with Madam Childs, the first female president of Athens College, and actually helped, you know, found the, the Huntsville Female Academy over there, mm-hmm. which is where Mary got her education. And uh, Mary, man, she was a tough lady. She had to kind of go it on her own. Her dad died the day after her 17th birthday. So she had to start teaching school just in rooms at the plantation after her dad died. And according to accounts of the day, not only was she really beautiful, but she also had the greatest talent for teaching and organizing schools of any woman in Alabama. But her beauty ended up being a a problem because in 1894, when she went to Huntsville Academy, one of the male teachers fell in love with her and he he wanted to marry her. And she said, no, I don't want to marry you. So she had to be the one to resign. And a newspaper at the time said public opinion would not have countenanced her continuing to tantalize him by her daily presence in his place of business. So she resigned. Mm. But their loss was our gain. She taught at schools in Arkansas and over in Huntsville, and uh, she had to move down to Birmingham. But then, of course, as you mentioned, in 1904, she came to Athens. And the way that came to be, she had been in Nashville working with the Reverend James McCoy. She was a bookkeeper and a secretary at the Alabama Christian Advocate, the Methodist publication. and. That she caught the attention of the Methodist leadership there. So when that came open and Dr. Glenn resigned from Athens State, their top choice refused to work at Athens because he couldn't afford to work there. 
The president got a payday only if money was left over at the end of all the bills. Like you mentioned, they had to pay the bills out of what they got paid. And so they were like, well, Mary, she's young. She was in her early 30s. She doesn't have any family. And we're like, she's perfect for the job. She can live on peanuts. And so it's a situation where they hired her basically initially because she was the only one who was willing and able to work for as little as it was going to pay. But the Huntsville Democrat was very prophetic. They said, more will place the old female college back on the high plane that Madam Childs once placed it. And sure enough, by 1906, two years after she got there, the board had their most successful year to date at the time in college history. They had brought the school from unclassified status to A class right. by the education board. They built Brown Hall. They built McCandless Hall. They updated Founders Hall, added electricity. She even cleared the cows that were grazing on the campus. In fact, if you look at the Athens City ordinances right now, there's still an ordinance that you cannot have cows grazing openly in town. And that's thanks to Moore because I guess she got fed up with the um, inevitable overabundance of fertilizer Mm -hmm. that the cows, and maybe they kept breaking down the picket fence. I don't know. But um, she really helped bring it up financially too, just by her own chutzpah. When, when the board said, no, we're not going to build McCandless Hall in 1912, we can't afford it. She said, okay, fine. I quit. And it was a standoff and the board backed down and they, you know, hired her back. They, you know, got the money and the way they got the money, she basically went around to every businessman in Athens, probably including your grandparents. They gave $500. Exactly. Martin Richardson Malone, Malone, that's Richard's family. She would go to their doors and and say, okay, I'm not leaving until you give me money. She raised $12,000 in one day in 1912. Yeah. I mean, think about that. This uh, woman. She put the girls in uniforms, too. Mm-hmm. Well, and Buzz, uh, Buzz Estes, mm-hmm. God rest his soul, yeah. our friend Buzz, he has said many times she was a force of nature. Oh, yeah. She stepped down in 1916 because she was medically, clinically just exhausted. She had been working 14 to 18 hour days for years, and that's when she married James McCoy and she called him my own darling boy and uh, never had kids of her own, but she became the only parent to all these stepkids. This is an interesting tidbit to me about Mary McCoy. Buzz always said, but you know, that was his step grandmother, really his grandmother for all intents right, and purposes. Right. She had a bit of a clairvoyancy about her. For example, her oldest stepson, who's also named Buzz, in 1922, he was in Houston for Air Force training and he wrote her a letter for Mother's Day. Well, six weeks later, she was in the bathroom just getting ready to go somewhere, and all of a sudden, she became overcome with panic that something was wrong with Buzz. Buzz was in danger. She ran out of the bathroom, hit her shoulder on the door so hard that she broke her shoulder. She broke her shoulder, and it wasn't long after that word came, Buzz had just died in an airplane crash at the same time she had this premonition. Yes. So she, even though it wasn't her flesh and blood, I mean, that's the kind of mother that she was and the connection she had with those children. But um, as uh, Richard mentioned, just a postscript about her later life, she just lived right on Beatty Street, right across from Founders Hall. Well, she did. On the and, uh, and she loved to go driving to settle her nerves. But Buzz always said what she really did was perform a nerve transfer because she transferred all her nerves to all the other drivers on the road. That's She'd right. just get in that car and go. Tell us about it. You see? Ride down the middle of the road. Just get out of <laughs> Everybody yeah. just get out of the way. So, yeah, she was a real force of nature and a yeah. force to be reckoned with. Um. It, it, it is true. I, I guess for the first time, uh, the college was accredited by the Southern Association of Schools and Colleges in 1911. That was an important mm-hmm. milestone. It was. And it got an A rating from mm-hmm. the Methodist Church. Yeah. And uh, these had to be earned. Right. And uh, she did put uh, electricity and indoor plumbing in Founders Hall. She added six new dormers uh, in the front to improve ventilation and to have dorm rooms. And the, the offices up there are very big. They're mm-hmm. it's surprisingly big. And the reason is you would have two or three or four girls in right. each uh, one. The renovation was in the front where the dormers are. The back part had been dorm rooms in 1857. Oh. Uh, the, the first uh, change in Founders Hall were the, 
going up from the second floor, those steps going up to the third floor, mm-hmm. but the dorm rooms were only in the back. You know, was Mildred, that Houston Hall? No, no. Okay, it, it was the back part of the third floor okay. where Mildred Cottle had an yes. office back there. And now, uh, she contributed $5,000 of her own money, and she directed a fundraising campaign among the Methodist churches. She lived in the small two-room apartment on the first floor of Founders Hall. Mm -hmm. Uh, So many of the early presidents lived in the building, and even some faculty members did. Uh, You'll notice there is a bathroom on each uh, floor. So where the president's office is today was part of her apartment Mm -hmm. there. Houston Hall was built in 1907 as a dormitory once again. This college was expanding. Mm -hmm. They had to build another floor for students. And this was in honor of George Houston of Athens, who was on the board of trustees before the Civil War and remained a lifelong supporter of Athens Female College. Also governor. Right. And and, and so important. Uh, Florence Brown was part of the history a waterborne typhoid epidemic uh, emerged in 1909 and infected 65 students. Right. Wow. And 15 of them died. God. Awful. Uh, Florence Brown was from Vinemont, and she taught literature and kept the books and was the only faculty member to remain on campus to care for the sick right. girls. Mm. And she died during the epidemic. And uh, her family, the Brown family of Coleman County, gave $7,000 to erect Brown Hall, and the generous people of Athens contributed another $3,000. And uh, President Moore secured the loan on her own signature uh, to build a 20-room dormitory for the girls. So the college was really expanding. And it uh, was recognized as a very good college. Mm-hmm. And I know at one time they were teaching uh, French, but they had a very good French instructor, and foreign language was part of the right. curriculum. In uh, 1912, 1914, local businessmen raised half of the $35,000 needed to construct the beautiful McCandless Hall, mm-hmm. which has been renovated recently. A gymnasium and a swimming pool which are now part of the Student Center, were built in 1918. Wait, is there still a swimming pool up under that Student Center? Uh, Chestine Hall, right? Sandridge. Oh, Sandridge, yes. Yes. Yeah, that's what I mean. In the basement. Chesting. Right. There, there's a door. And uh, sometimes I've gone back in there, the maintenance people were doing something, and you can still see remains of the swimming, the swimming pool. pool. I've swam oh, okay. in it. When you were a kid? Yeah, we took life saving there. Now, that wasn't 1919. No, it was 1948 <laughs> or 49. Okay. Uh, between 1891 and 1921, a prominent family of local attorneys gave important leadership to the college. Mm-hmm. Which family was that? Judge Benton Sanders oh, yeah. and his son, William T. Mm-hmm. Sanders. William T. was president of the Board of Trustees. And in 1926, a dormitory for 86 young women was built, Sanders Hall. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it remained a dormitory until recently. Uh, He was a lawyer for the L&N Railroad and was willing to give his time and money to help the college like so many prominent Athenian Mm -hmm. families uh, had done. Eugene Naylor was president between 1930 and 1949. And incidentally, if you ever want to see pictures of past presidents, you can go into the library. Mm -hmm. In the back, there's a picture of all of them. Naylor was the first president to have a Ph.D., which he earned in psychology from Northwestern University. He was also uh, the longest-serving president so far in the university's history. To expand enrollment during the Great Depression, men were admitted in 1931. Right. Uh, This led to the establishment of a basketball and a football program. In 1934, the state legislature approved a name change from Athens College for Women to Athens College. Hmm. So the name Athens College 
dates in 1934, all the different name changes through the years. Mm-hmm. That's right. Now, I remember the basketball team, but the football team was long gone by the time I was coming up. I did remember. you ever go to those yeah. games? Yeah, I did. I went to them, and Coach Smith, Bull Smith, was the coach. Where did and, they play football at? Uh, Athens High School Stadium. Okay. But they practice out there on the field that's there now. Walter Walter was one of them, and Marvin Clem, and... Uh, all those old boys come back from the war, and they all... Was it Brett? Uh, Brett? Ralph Brett. Was Ralph one of them. Brett. Yeah. And they won a lot of important games. Right, they did. It was good football. Now, they didn't play the University of Alabama. They might have no, beaten them no, back they, in the... They the yeah. <laughs> I know. Swanee and... Yeah. Uh, Jacksonville State or something right. like that. Uh, with little external funding, times were hard during the Great Depression for the college and the students. Produce from the campus garden and two small farms were canned in the basement of McCandless Hall. That's cool. There was a cannery. Dairy cows grazed on the flat lawn of the South Campus. And because cash was in short supply, some students bartered to pay their tuition with farm produce and jewelry. How about that? Wow. On occasion, uh, President Naylor did not take a salary so that there would be enough money to pay the small faculty. It's hard to understand the sacrifices Absolutely. that people have made. To well, and we live in a day and age where college presidents and CEOs make right. exponentially more than right. the lowest ones on the totem pole. But right. back then, you was, it was a sacrifice of service and of your finances, too, wasn't it? Exactly. In the late 30s, a women's hosiery mill opened on Hobbs Street Mm -hmm. across from the campus. A businessman from Chicago furnished the machines and supervisory personnel. College students ran the machines and shipped the products. What was the name of it? I remember when I was growing up. Athens Lingerie. That's it. Athens Lingerie. We call it the Panty Factory. (laughs) I do well, remember when it was Health Techs when I was growing up. It was called Health Techs, and it had a factory outlet. Mama right. used to get us the seconds, right. hoodies, right. and things like that. Right. There. Jimmy Hargroves worked there for his education. That's how he got his really? Athens College degree. He worked so, at the panty factory. And you know, I, think, <laughs> I love that y'all called it the panty factory. What, what it was. <laughs> there, there were a lot of people who right. uh, got scholarships. There. Yeah. And that's how they did it. In 1938, a doctor from Hartzell deeded a 240-acre farm to the college, and a fund drive raised $45,000 to help pay off a $60,000 debt. So you can see the widespread support. I don't know if maybe we could raise $45,000 today. I don't know. I don't know. know. It just shows you. Well, now, if somebody donated a 240-acre farm today, it probably would raise a little bit more than $45,000 the way property values are. Right. By 1940, a third of the students at Athens College were in the Earn to Learn program, making cotton products such as ironing board covers at the textile mill near the college. Mm -hmm. Students signed a contract to work about a thousand hours a year for a minimum of 12 cents an hour for an apprentice and 40 cents an hour for a more experienced worker. Judge James Newby later stated, that the college would have closed in those years if President Naylor had not swung the mill deal. Wow. In 1942, Methodist churches throughout North Alabama collected money on Athens College Sunday. This, this was a tradition, I think, maybe once a year, all the collections of Methodist churches would go to Athens College. In 1943, uh, the college needed to raise $350,000 to meet Southern Association standards to improve the library and the science lab. The Methodist Church pledged $250,000 if the college could raise $100,000. So once again, the Methodist Church, alumni, local citizens, and friends reached deep into their pockets to keep their college alive. With an enrollment of 488 students, Mm. Naylor Hall was built in 1948 to house 36 male students. Football team. Mainly the football team. That's right. I remember that. And all of these buildings have gone through various uh, uses through the years. Uh, For example, Brown Hall 
Uh, my first office was oh, Brown really? Hall, a little place. Yeah. Uh, the secretary, I think it was Christy Pepper, she was kind of in the hallway. I've even taught classes there, and uh, I think typing might have been there for one at one point. But uh, starting in the early 70s, at one time we had five sororities, national sororities okay. there. And each one had a room on the second floor of Brown Hall. Oh. But the sororities really decorated those rooms, just really, really nice, mm-hmm. nice furniture. Yeah. They mm-hmm. look good. So the same thing is true if you go into Founders Hall, for example. That's where the academic dean's office was, the assistant dean, the business office. Yes. was part there. So the whole buildings, before we had the classroom building, it was hard to find a place to teach. Right. You know. Perry James led the college in the 1950s. He raised $115,000 for scholarships and in 1957 persuaded a successful Methodist businessman from Birmingham, Newman H. Waters, yes. to contribute $50,000 toward the construction of a science building. That's oh, right. wow. We that was named, a lot of money back then. It was, named Waters Hall. Mm-hmm. In 1963, he gave the college half interest in a three-story building in downtown Birmingham That's called right. the Athens Building. Is that still there? The uh, building's still there, but I don't know if the they, sign... They had to sell it to pay off the debt. Oh, hmm <laughs> Mr. Waters' son-in-law was Dr. Jolly, who was our oh, yeah. minister at the First Baptist yes, Church. Yes, that's right. He would wear a coattail to preach every time. Is that Did right? he? he? He was a good preacher, too. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Mary Mason family donated the Mason Beatty Mansion to the college in 1959. Right. Right. And that was the home that was built by town founder and college founder Robert Beatty. Right. That was her grandfather, right? Yeah. A beautiful place. Mm -hmm. Virgil McCain was president from 59 to 65. He eliminated a $200,000 debt and increased the endowment. And because of recruitment efforts in New York and Chicago, the enrollment climbed to over 1,300 students I remember all in 1965. And so a new girls' dorm was built, McCain Hall. Beautiful white building today. Well, now I have a question about that, too. Yeah. Because we know what was going on about that same time, right? The Vietnam War. Right. I've heard that some of the folks who came from other areas to Athens College, part of it was to try to keep from being shipped off to Vietnam. Is that... The case? Uh, it's hard to know. Uh, that could have been the case everywhere. It wasn't just yeah. unique. But uh, we had some wonderful students from it's, up there. Yeah. Well, some yeah. of them have stayed here. Right. Thank God. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we had one guy from New York City, and he liked to bring groups. Uh, we had musical groups come here. Right. Uh, one of them was the Allman Brothers Band. Oh, wow. Came to Athens College. We had Jose Feliciano. You know, somebody asked me just maybe last month if either the Athens State Archives or uh, the Limestone County Archives had a recording of the Allman Brothers Band playing at Athens State. And I said, Lord, I wish mm-hmm. we did. That would no be idea. so cool. They had uh, Strawberry Alarm Clock <laughs> from, from <laughs> New York, Black Oak, Arkansas. Uh-huh. Uh huh. And what I missed in later times, when I came, we had about at least 500 students right. living on those 40 acres. Oh, it's, wow. It was elbow to Totally elbow. different than it is now. That's what know. I missed through, through the sure. years, were the students on campus. Yeah. Everything was a dorm. The student center was only for students. There were pool tables. There were ping pong tables. Students ate there. The cafeteria was busy, and you could have 8 o'clock classes and have students right. be there at 8 o'clock. Well, but it's just a lot more vibrant to have it certainly know, students. Is. Which, although, I mean, Athens State was a little bit ahead of the game um, by the time COVID came along. I know I'm jumping ahead right. in the history because they had already transitioned so much over to computer and online. Right, but nothing can compare to the excitement of Correct. having five hundred. That's almost as big as Elmont. Right, <laughs> it's bigger than <laughs> Elmont. It's, <laughs> it's closing in on Ardmore. I'll tell you what. Uh, uh, Dr. Phil Pott of Morgan County was the first and only president to have graduated from Athens College. Oh, is that Interesting. Right? Yeah. He earned his M.A. from... Auburn, and a Ph.D. in education from Columbia University right. in 
in New York City. In 1966, after uh, he had graduated, he returned to Athens from Illinois State University, where he chaired the Department of Education and Psychology. Right. So I guess after Columbia, he went to Illinois State right. and then came down here as president. Four new dorms were built to accommodate the large number of students coming from the Northeast. Uh, Carl Martin, a local... Which was my uncle. Mm-hmm. And he was uh, an insurance executive and chairman of the Board of Trustees. So important right. leadership. Uh, he gave the land for the buildings. Right. Mm-hmm. I have a question for Richard from growing up here. What was it like for y'all? Because you were about the same age as some of these students that were coming No, no, in, I you? was married. And, and they were okay. cutting through my yard was every gonna, night. Well, I was about to ask, <laughs> what was it like? they would wake us up in the middle of the night. Fussing and fighting, and of course, woke up the bait. Oh, it's something. But Back anyway. then, what did the what did the local folks think about so well, many people coming in hippie. from all over? They were hippie looking and just weird, and uh, couldn't get over that. But we learned to love them. We learned <laughs> them. But anyway, we cut off that path where they wouldn't cut through my backyard. <laughs> Some of them were that way, but maybe half. But the other half. Yeah. Uh, I think the girls were pretty, pretty oh, the normal. Girls, yeah. Pretty normal. So what you're saying is all the guys were a bunch of dirty hippies. Well, I don't. You know, I, I, <laughs> I would, wouldn't I say, would say it's no, it a minority. Yeah, that, but they were, uh, we were glad to have them. Yeah, of course. The uh, men's dorms were named for the Martin, Woodruff, and Biles families right. who helped the college. Pete Biles lived across the street from the college, mm-hmm. and he helped give money to the college, and of course, Toad Woodruff did too. Mm-hmm. The the Biles family gave a large farm, oh, okay, very large farm north of the campus, and, right? And and uh, they had to sell that too when they right. were trying to get rid of their debts. Mm-hmm. The apartments are up the street. Gotcha, up there on Elton Street. Yeah. Uh, To meet the minimum Southern Association standards in 1970, the college had to do something with the library. Oh, yeah. The library was just a wing in Founders Hall. And uh, we had an interim president, Dr. Gobble, who had been president of Jackson College Methodist up in uh, Tennessee. Mm -hmm. Uh, The money to build the wing onto uh, Founders Hall was by the estate of Dr. Alvin Powers. Powers, Dr. Dr. Powers. Powers. At Powers Hospital. It was $50,000, and uh, his four daughters had gone to Athens College. Mm-hmm. And so if he had, had not given the money, I'm not sure what the college would have done. Its accreditation was conditionally approved in 1970 on condition that they expand the library. Right. Mm-hmm. And that remained a problem for a while. Uh, Dr. Cindy Sandridge became president in 1970 when Dr. Philpott uh, resigned to become vice president of Memphis State. And uh, the problem during this period, 70 to 75, was that we now had Calhoun Community College down the road, and you could go there very inexpensively. Very inexpensive. Uh, The University of Alabama in Huntsville was moving forward, and it didn't cost very much to go there. All private schools, I mean, they got no state aid, so you had to raise your own money. Right. And that that was the problem. And uh, the enrollment declined to 800 students Mm -hmm. from about 1,300. And uh, and we had very good businessmen. They, They never missed a payday. At Athens College. Oh, wow. I understand at times, at the end of the month, there was less than $50 left in the bank. I understood that, too. Can you believe it? Wow. For the entire college. For the entire college. (laughs) But they never missed a paycheck. That's ramen noodle time right there. (laughs) The the faculty and the administration and everybody was eating ramen noodles with the students at that point, weren't they? That's right. (laughs) Um, Dr. Sandridge uh, made one last effort to save the, the college, and it was successful, to try to somehow get the state to take over and mm-hmm. to give financial support. At first, uh, Governor Wallace was not in favor of this. That's right. And we had opposition from the university in Huntsville. They right. didn't want it. They didn't want it. I'm sure North Alabama right. didn't Florida want State. it. Right. Uh, nobody wanted it. So he had that political fight up against him. And now, he was a great communicator. He was. If anything, he had a Ph.D. also from Northwestern in sociology. Oh, he was a beautiful speaker. 
So uh, one time uh, when he was headed down to Montgomery to talk to Governor Wallace, uh, I've heard that uh, Judge Rosenau told Sandridge, now you remind Governor Wallace that when he made his first announcement to become governor of Alabama, he made it from the Athens College campus. That's That's right. right. That's what the story is. And another person who deserves a lot of credit was Doug Greenhall. Dub's first. Yes, Doug Dub, Spurs. Dub was his campaign manager. Right. And if you wanted to reach ah. George Wallace, you went through Dub. Oh, Interesting. Yeah. Then he, he would get the, the county to vote and so forth. So Wallace himself was a Methodist. And slowly, he you know, this was the state's oldest institution. So he asked Attorney General Bill Baxley, how can we do this? He said, I'll support it if you can find a way. And Baxley said, you know, the state can accept debt-free gifts. Mm-hmm. If you want to give the state of Alabama your uh, farm, we'll accept it. Sure. They'll, they'll accept it. So that was the challenge now, was to get rid of $700,000 of debt. And that's where, of course, the people of Limestone County and Athens uh, came in, and especially James Beasley. I don't know how much anybody gave But he was very, very important as a contributor. He did so much for the community. Uh, They named the field for him. Busy field. field. Right. But, uh, you know, if the people of Athens, and that's why it's been all throughout the Mm -hmm. years. So that's why the college, you know, still. um, It really is the amazing underlying theme through this whole story, isn't it? How this really is the community's college. And it's the community who kept it going for 200 years, 200 years next year. One of the people, I don't know if you're going to get to it, Tommy Carter. Uh, and Well, you may know more than, than I do, uh, oh. but I'll, I'll tell you what I know, okay. and you can add All to right. that. Uh, our legislators are two. Yeah. Uh, Tommy Carter mm-hmm. was essential oh, yeah. in getting it through the legislature. We had a lot of opposition. We did. Mm-hmm. Uh, one was Sid McDonald from Albertville. We had UAH against us. We had the Alabama Commission. Everybody was. And Tommy had to put on boxing gloves. He Mm -hmm. did. That's right. I mean, he was ready. You know, if you want to, you know, I'll meet you. He's one of the old Elkmont boys. He did it. He was wonderful. And it can't not be stressed enough. He had played football, I believe, for two years at Auburn. He did. And uh, he came and played basketball for the Athens College Bears. And uh, the Carter uh, PE building is named for him. Oh, okay. He has a portrait in Founders Hall as a modern day founder. Uh, the other person should be Albert McDonald of, yes. of Huntsville, uh, mm-hmm. the state senator. Mm-hmm. And we had to get it through the Senate as right. well. And right. th- they both deserve equal credit right. along with Governor right. uh, Wallace. You want to add anything to that? No, you hit it. Story? Right. Uh, I heard Tommy just told the House of Representatives, I'm not going back to Limestone County and tell them that this college is closing. The second battle was to get the Methodist Church to agree Mm -hmm. to give it to the state. Mm -hmm. And so Sandridge and one of his in-laws, Curtis Tomlin, who worked there at the college, had to go to Nashville and persuade the officials up there to relinquish ownership Mm -hmm. of the college. And it wasn't easy. You know, the college was worth millions of dollars. It was worth it. And the Methodist Church owned that. Sure. And uh, our officials just simply said, well, if you don't give up, the college will close. Right. right. So they were kind of between a rock and a hard place at that point, weren't they? So the Methodist Church also deserves credit for coming to the rescue, right. being willing to give up ownership. Right. And so in 1975, miraculously, uh, Athens College became Athens State College. That was a big mm-hmm. deal. Well, I remember it. That mm-hmm. was a big deal. And the, uh, well, it was November 24th. Mm hmm. So uh, Athens was accepted as an upper level, upper level, junior, senior, mm-hmm. working closely with the Alabama Community Colleges. Mm-hmm. That was our right. mandate. We, we played a big role in going around the state. Some instructors, even down in South Alabama, they didn't have four years of college degree. I remember some of our professors actually traveling down there, Charles West and yeah. Bert mm-hmm. Hayes, to 
offer classes, and we played a big role there. Dr. Chastain was president both of Calhoun Community College and Athens Athens State College. College. Right. Mm -hmm. So uh, we had one president and two colleges, and he was that until 1991 when they separated the presidencies, and Dr. Jerry Bartlett, who lives on Beatty Street, right? Yeah, uh, became president uh, for 17 years and accomplished as much as anybody in history. Uh, at one point, our budget grew to 45 million dollars. gracious! This was as large as the combined budgets of the city of Athens and Limestone County. Wow. It's important. Mm -hmm. College in your town, you're lucky. That's right. Uh, In 1998, and I give him uh, credit, uh, we became a university. Right. And that really made a lot of difference. I would go to conferences and give papers. And when I could say uh, Athens State University, because everybody else was from you know, Vanderbilt, yeah. right. Or right. Georgia Tech. You know, I was at University of North Alabama in 1998. That's I graduated there yeah. in 2000. And so I remember there being a little bit of yin, yin, yin. Yeah. Oh, about, yeah. well, it's only two years. Should it really have university status? Right. But it's something, you know, you've got people getting their upper level degrees there. Right. And uh, what was interesting is that Fob James, at first, Fob James was against our college, right. mm-hmm. you know, but... He later changed, and I remember he came to the uh, inauguration of us as universities, gave a wonderful speech Mm -hmm. in support of Athens College. He really did. And, you know, uh, it has been a success story. We have grown from 800 students to about Mm 3,000. 800 for four years, and now we have 3,000 for two. two. Mm -hmm. Uh, At one time, uh, we had possibly the largest social science number of majors of, of any university mm-hmm. in, in Alabama. Wow. And uh, our uh, criminal justice program has always been very large. Uh, and I know in, in cost per student, we've always been the lowest in the state. We're much, much lower. And our tuition has always been much, much lower than any other university. Mm-hmm. So that's been, been helpful. Under Bartlett, uh, in addition, we built our new beautiful library. Right. Yes, which right. also houses the Athens State University archives. And I don't know what the situation is right now for being able to go and research with COVID. I know they were closed yeah. some, but there's a lot of great information, lot. not just about the college. I got to give a plug for the Athens State University right. archives. Right. They've done an amazing job there of compiling history, not just of the college. But that archives was established long before the Limestone County Archives was. And so there are a lot of items in their collection that really relate more to Athens and Limestone County history Mm -hmm. in general and not just at the college. So for anybody who's researching family or local history, in Limestone County, or I would encourage university you, history. Yeah, exactly. Like, it's, it's, I would, and lots of amazing photos and you know old newspapers and things. I would encourage you to make your appointment to research at the Athens State University archives as well. The other uh, thing we had under President Bartlett was our new classroom building. Mm-hmm. Yes, and we used to teach everywhere, yeah. even closets. <laughs> but it was so nice. Uh, we had large lecture rooms, and uh, you could have. 30, 40 students, right. you know, and it was it was so nice. Uh, also, he did the renovation to Waters Hall, Sanders Hall, McCain Hall, and Founders Hall. You should just go in those right. buildings and see what they're like today. They're beautiful. They're just, and, but this That's was under right. Dr. Bartlett. So uh, he left us a beautiful, uh, thriving campus for the 21st uh, century. He... Uh, Retired, and in 2008, we had Dr. Robert Glenn, mm-hmm. and then... Uh, who, by the way, was uh, was it his grandfather who yeah, was president? I think so. Before? Yes, it was. In, uh-huh. in late 1800s, Glenn. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. then in 2020, uh, Dr. Philip Way came from Slippery Rock uh, State University in Pennsylvania as president. See, yeah. The thing about Athens College is it brought good faculty people and we're sitting in here with a man that wrote a Alabama history book for the whole entire state. Mm-hmm. And we had other college professors oh, out yeah. there that did so many wonderful things for our community and our town mm-hmm. and their families. It's, mm-hmm. it's just unreal. So we've been blessed with Dr. That. Mildred Cottle and Lorraine Papps. They were the, our history professors. Sure. They did a wonderful job. Oh, they did a wonderful job. While, while they were there. I enjoyed Dr. Mm-hmm. Balloon. 
the, the uh, librarian. The li- he mm-hmm. was a mess. Man. <laughs> he was a mess. Well, and, and then I, when I was a little boy, I remember uh, the world famous architect. We got two houses. Out Rudolph. There. Rudolph. Paul Don't, Rudolph. Okay. And Paul Rudolph, you know, became dean at uh, Yale University Architect School. Hmm. Right. And well, and to bring it full circle, if it hadn't been for Millie Caudle, who was my neighbor growing up in North mm-hmm. Athens, we wouldn't be sitting where we are right now. That's right. At least partially due to it's her efforts legacy. as a city council person. She right. um, helped make this library. Our listeners will know we're recording here at the Athens uh, Limestone County Public Library, and she helped make that possible. Well, this is an amazing coverage of 200 years in about an hour of history of the Athens College. We've got it up to 2021. I do want to mention that Athens State University is celebrating its grand bicentennial in 2022. Preparations for that began, what, four years ago? Something like that. And you're on that committee. But that's going to be something, I know that the college has a lot of great plans and events to celebrate 200 years. I mean, it's a monumental achievement to keep in it. And as we learned from this history, there were many times that we just about didn't make it to 200 years, didn't we? And you know, that's true of many colleges and universities, even in Alabama. Uh, I would say the next 100 years, some of the private colleges that we have today won't be there. Right. Well, all right. Well, Dr. Joyner, thank you again so much for joining us. We always love having you on. And Richard, you got anything else to add to this conversation? I can't say another word. (laughs) All righty then. Well, thank you so much. We'll see you next time with our next episode of Homegrown History, your Limestone County, Alabama history podcast. You've been listening to Homegrown History, presented by the Athens Limestone County Public Library and the Limestone County Archives in Athens, Alabama. For more information and to submit questions or suggestions, please visit limestonearchives.com. And to hear other recordings from our Library Voices series, check out our website at alcpl.org. You can also listen on Spotify and Apple Podcasts.